her. So I met through her mother, Wendy Stengel, <laughs> who's a nutritionist. And she became one of the star members of my mastermind group. I run a financial mastermind group, helping people to improve their finances and become more financially literate. And she just really did a great job in that class. So I wanted to interview her because she has some interesting things that she's, uh, she has some interesting things going on in her life. And let me explain those. Maddie has a BFA or a Bachelor of Fine Arts in acting from Ithaca College. She worked at the House Theater in Chicago and she's in Chicago right now. And she worked to increase accessibility for sensory sensitive and autistic audience members. We're gonna be talking about that and the impact she's had on the autistic and sensory sensitive community. And she recently started a business called Final Draft, which helps students and pre-professionals with editing their papers, which can really be the difference between getting into where you want to get into or not. Speaking of, she just recently got into a very good college, I think Ivy League almost. I'm, is it Ivy League? Or I mean, Western? technically not because it's not on the East Coast. But I consider it Ivy great. <laughs> <laughs> High level college, Northwestern, where she's going to pursue a degree in communication. Her burning desire is to be a speechwriter for public figures and nonprofit organization. And she's also conversational in ASL, American Sign Language, and dedicated to making accessibility for the disabled or neurologically diverse populations or community um, a part of the mainstream narrative. So a lot of cool stuff. And we're gonna start with talking about acting, but before I do, how are you doing today, Maddie? <laughs> Thank you for having me. I am doing great. It's been a little bit chilly and rainy here in Chicago, but we got a nice long walk in, did some chores, everything's good. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad to know you're doing well. Um, and let's start with theater. So I want to, I want to learn about like, how did you get into theater? How did, how, like, what, what was that moment like when you were like, this is something I want to pursue or go after? Mm. I wanted to be a dancer first. Um, I was obsessed with the Nutcracker. I thought my life goal was to be Clara. Um, I think I started dancing at my first dance class was at two. And that was kind of the goal first and foremost was to become a professional dancer. And then a little bit further in, I think it was in fourth grade, my mom said I had to go to summer camp and I was furious. I didn't want to go to summer camp. I wanted to go to dance camp if there was one and there was not, but there was theater camp. And so I went to theater camp and I did my first play and fell in love with it. I loved the entire community process. I loved the being on stage. I loved the attention as a tiny wannabe dancer. And I really loved the director of that show. His name was Micah and he um, was the first person that encouraged me to go that way. So it started very early. I danced all the way through school and then I ended up transferring high schools to a performing arts high school. So I actually was a musical theater major in high school at a magnet program. And then I went to college. Very cool. And mm -hmm. that's awesome. You've mentioned Micah had a, he was very encouraging to you at the very beginning stages. Do you remember any specific things he said or any encouragement he gave you that really stuck with you when it came to acting or theater? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't remember anything specific. I think he pulled my mom aside and said I was pretty good at this and that it yeah. would be something I could do when my mom told me that later. But I loved his energy. I loved the acceptance I felt. And I loved that he talked to me. I felt like we were friends. It was the, I really liked grownups as a kid more than kids probably. <laughs> and I loved that he wanted to spend time with me and he had experience and I loved seeing him on stage. It was just as exciting to see him on stage as off. So he was yeah. really important to me. Very awesome. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. So you went to Ithaca College, started studying acting. By this point, you're starting to, you know, have that experience behind you in acting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some like lessons you've learned through that world? I, I have no, I've never acted before. I've tried and it's horrible. It's like very awkward <laughs> um, when I do it. So what are some lessons you've learned from acting that you, you use nowadays or that really stick with you? Mm -hmm. Well, now I don't work professionally in theater anymore. And when I first made that decision, I was really afraid that my degree wouldn't be quote unquote useful. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been the exact opposite. I actually wrote my entrance essay to grad school about the necessary skills I got for my degree. So in acting, so much of acting is about playing off of the person in front of you, about reacting authentically, about paying attention to what 
the environment and the people around you are doing, seeing, feeling, experiencing, mm -hmm. and reacting accordingly. Um, the language delivery system, I'm not doing a great <laughs> demonstration of that in this moment, but really the vocal health skills that I learned in college were very, very useful. I mean, even in situations like waiting tables, you know, you talk to people for a six or seven hour shift and your voice is just shot at the end of that. And I felt like I had a leg up in my physical health because of the training I had in school. So vocal health, confidence, being able to address a room of strangers, being able to talk to people, meeting new people. I mean, it's really been useful in job interviews. And that's part of why I wanted to, um, offer any kind of professional skill coaching or, you know, preparation. Yeah. Just to let people know that you can be confident. You can go into a room and talk to people like people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing that it's really big for confidence, like just being mm -hmm. on stage growing mm -hmm. up is really big for confidence. Mm -hmm. And a big part of acting is just like being in the moment and reacting to what's happening in a real way. Is that true? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's about being present in the moment, being grounded in the moment, mm -hmm. not reacting to something ahead of time. Um, that's a really important part. You know, you don't want to give away the end of the story in the first scene. And so you keep that hidden. But in real life, if you are talking to someone and you don't know how they're going to react or you need to have a really important conversation, you don't want to give it away. You know, you don't want to start something off at a level that is not appropriate for the moment. So okay. really reading the room and reading your counterpart is part of that. Very cool. That's awesome. And I think that's very cool. And you mentioned, so you, what's your, what was your story? Like, what was your journey like in acting? Like, what were some things you overcame? What were some things that challenges um, when it came to, to acting in that life? What, what, what are some things that happened along the way? Yeah. Um, Theater and performance and art is, it is, it goes hand in hand with rejection. And yeah. so really learning to bounce back from rejection is part of that. I would not say I'm very good at that. That's not something I do super well, but I have friends that are part of that grind and they get up and they go and audition every single day and nine times out of 10, it doesn't work out. And they have the confidence and the self assurance and the knowledge to make sure that they get up and go the next day after being rejected. So yeah. that is just sort of an overarching theme for theater. Um, I know for me, acting has made me generally, I think more aware of the people around me. I kind of talked about that and why it's important, but, you know, I use my acting skills to sign or to talk to people or to go to job interviews or to, you know, really learn to market yourself. You know, when you're acting, you are your brand. You are your, you're the whole package. You're selling yourself. And so learning yeah. to just learning basic marketing skills, but then marketing skills that show off your best self is mm -hmm. crucial to any young professional. And it's um, a really incredible gift that you're given in theater. Yeah. I love that. I think especially nowadays, I think there's like a paradigm shift where it's more towards like just being your authentic self and then like kind of like attracting the right people to you. Like I've noticed that in business, like that's, it wasn't like that. I don't think like in the eighties or the seventies, I don't think mm -hmm. I wasn't. No, <laughs> I mean, I, I also was not, but from what I've heard, uh, yeah. people were not focused on manifesting anything or yeah. bringing certain energies towards them. It, you know, that just wasn't part of our general vocabulary. And I do think that as sort of mental health is destigmatized. We mm -hmm. have introduced this new vocabulary to the common narrative that is really focused on the kind of people you interact with and what is and isn't acceptable and what does or doesn't feel good when you're having a, an exchange with someone. Yeah. And I think that's awesome that you kind of, you you were brought up in that world of just authentically like reacting to what's happening. So okay. I want to ask you a question, like what tips do you have for people in that new world of marketing yourself? Like what tips would you have for that as someone who came up in that world? So some of it may be natural, you, you grew up with it. Mm -hmm. what, what are some tips with that? And also maybe dealing with rejection a little bit if you're comfortable sharing. Sure, mm -hmm. I would say not being afraid of color, both literally and figuratively, you know, not being afraid of 
something that is really exciting and big and bold, you know, that might put you off and you could look at a job posting that it's at this incredible company and think, I am not qualified for that. I don't have any business doing that. And that's not true. It's a job just like anything else. You should approach it like it is an incredible job opportunity and not this idealized thing. Yeah. Um, I also mean literally don't be afraid of color. I firmly believe in using color on resumes, you know, in moderation. Yeah. Uh, I use a teal color on my resume and that's been a great conversation starter or just something to stand out a little bit. You know, I, I wear a lot of jewelry. I have a bright sense of style. And I think leaning on color gives people an immediate insight into who you are and what you bring and kind of your energy. You can do a lot by the color you put forward, but you can yeah. tell a lot about yourself um, with the color you put forward. And then in terms of rejection, it kind of gets easier over time, depending on who you are. It didn't get easier for me over time. It always felt personal. Mm -hmm. Even when I switched and was on the other side of the table, I worked as a talent agent specifically for um, our theater division at that job. And yeah. it wasn't personal. I didn't leave rooms with auditions thinking, wow, that person is terrible. And I don't want to be their friend. I don't like them. I never left feeling that way. I, you know, it was usually logistics or do we have space for them? Are we a good fit? Can we make their career, you know, can we position their career to take that next step? It wasn't ever about the person unless they were really, really mean. Yeah. Um, so I think rejection, as much as you can depersonalize it mm -hmm. is best. Those are the people that are most successful in theater. I think the ones that don't go home every day and think, wow, that person didn't like me and it's entirely my fault. And now I have to change. It's not about that. The yeah. best thing you can do is to walk in and be authentically yourself and know that they're making a decision based on how you would fit into their puzzle. And if you don't fit, then it wouldn't be comfortable for you either. You don't want to be the wrong puzzle piece in a puzzle. You don't want to force it. You just want to kind of like let it happen if it's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I know that's hard to do with. I, I, it's a struggle not taking things personally. That's a big part of business too, is like it's business is not personal. It's, mm -hmm. you know, that. So, yeah. very, very cool. Um, touching on a lot of different things. I want to ask you a question kind of off base, not off base, but like <laughs> kind of off okay. the wall. And it's why teal? Why the color teal, do you think? That's just my I'll favorite color. Okay. I don't know. It's a, it's a color that makes me feel confident. I wear a lot of teal. I have a lot of teal in my house. Yeah, I, this is funny. I didn't in any way intend to be talking about the color teal, but <laughs> it's just something that I think is a good reflection of me. I usually wear something teal or bluish or green and, you know, it's a through line. I, that's a color I feel confident in. That is a color that demonstrates a little bit about me in some way. Yeah. And so from an on paper basis, you get something about my personality in addition to my qualifications. Yeah. And I just think that's, that's very smart. I like that idea. Did you come up with that or did you hear that somewhere? Like, was there inspiration for that? Like, how did you come up with that idea of using color on a resume or just in general, like the color of your personality and everything that you do? In theater, you're definitely encouraged to wear solid colors. We call them jewel tones, you know, and at major auditions, you will see every woman in a different jewel tone dress coming yeah. in. And it's because people can reference and say, oh, the girl in red or, oh, the man wearing the yellow shirt. And yeah. it, it's just a little bit of something to hold on to, to associate you with, especially yeah. when you're putting yourself into a stack of options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's sort of like, it's a, like a signature, like makes you more memorable. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love that. And you said a huge thing that you're very passionate about is making theater accessible. And you worked in this, like making theater accessible to the autistic community, mm -hmm. people who have, who are sense, sensory, um, sensitive to like, I guess, sensory overload. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I had a question. I wanted to know about how you got into that. But before that, mm -hmm. what's the difference between autism and someone who would have like a, a sensory overload disorder? What is the word? Sure. Sensory sensitive. Mm -hmm. I will caveat this whole part of our conversation with, I do not identify as having sensory sensitivity. I am not on the autism spectrum. I'm not a 
disabled person. It's just something I care about. It's something I'm interested in learning about. And I really care about the rights of people that do fall into those communities. So in no way am I an expert on this, but um, sensory sensitivity is a much broader scale versus autism, which is a specific diagnosis that falls um, on a spectrum. So people can be very high functioning and experience um, a more quote unquote normal daily life, something that looks more normal to the outside eye. Mm. But on the other side of the spectrum, you might have someone that's entirely nonverbal and really uncomfortable in social situations. So without trying to go into too much of that detail, I will encourage people to do their own research about autism and autism spectrum. Um, and then sensory sensitivity is broader. It can be something as small as feeling really uncomfortable with loud sounds, loud music, loud noises, or maybe feeling every sense um, in a heightened way that makes day-to-day -day life uncomfortable. So again, I will encourage people to do research and go to sources written by people that experience that diagnosis or have that day-to-day -day experience. I don't, it's just, again, something I care about. So yeah. I think the best way to differentiate that is to ask the people that experience those things. Yeah. But that's kind of a, you know, sensory sensitivity is much broader genre. Um, mm -hmm. And then autism is a specific diagnosis. Okay, that makes sense. I wanted to ask what the difference was there, if it was similar, okay. Um, and you mentioned that you care about that a lot. And I sense that you do. How did, how did that become something that was on your radar? Something that you started, um, started caring about? Cause I know a lot of people may not think about it. So how did that become something that was on your radar? I don't know that there was a pivotal moment really. Mm -hmm. I have always felt a very strong, close connection to the deaf community. My mom is a speech pathologist and yeah. Growing up, you know, my mom is a single mom. And so my sister and I were in tow quite often with her. And we, you know, would visit clients. We would go to classes with her. We would go to big events for her speech clinic where she works with disabled children. And so at a young age, it wasn't abnormal to me to meet someone disabled, to meet someone with a neurological disorder, to meet someone different. And so I felt a strong connection to American Sign Language as a language, and that sparked interest in the deaf community, and then interest in the deaf community sparked interest in accessibility as a whole. Yeah. Um, I remember I was waiting tables in college, and this family came in, and their son had cerebral palsy, I think, and he had a walker, and he, I think, was 10 or 12, and was so excited to be out in the world, but was not comfortable sitting at a table for long periods of time. And so there was this hallway in the restaurant that mostly just staff came in and out of, but it was by the restrooms. Yeah. And there was a period of time where his mom stood with him and just kind of let him run up and down the hallway. Mm -hmm. And I stood and talked with them and she had this sense of relief when I told her my mom was a speech pathologist and that I felt a real close kinship to people and children that are disabled. And seeing the relief of her, not feeling like she needed to explain her child, not feeling like she needed to protect her child, mm -hmm. that was really impactful. And then also connecting with her child, just saying hello, interacting with him, making a joke, watching him laugh, seeing him find joy in a restaurant that I also loved was such a basic human to human connection that that kind of got me thinking as I stepped into my adult life, you know, how can how can we demystify disability of all sorts? And how can we make people that love and support disabled people feel like they don't need to apologize or explain this person that they and the disabled person are welcome in our community? That's really important to me, making everyone feel like they can be part of the world around them. I love that, that's powerful. Um, you mentioned, so, I think that's very, um, that story is, uh, I like it because it really gets to the, like the heart of the matter of like the acceptance. That was a huge thing. Like just, just that acceptance and not having to like feel like you have to explain it or walk on eggshells mm -hmm. was a huge thing. How, so like, like in the day to day when you were making theater more accessible to autistic or sensory sensitive people, how did you mm -hmm. do that? What were the first steps and what did you learn through doing that too? Yeah, I got really lucky that the theater I stepped into had 
um, someone previously on the staff that had introduced the conversation of accessible theater to them specifically for deaf people and blind and low vision. Um, and the way you do that is different for a community. You know, it's different, a different way of addressing things. There are things like captions. There are American Sign Language interpreters. There are audio sensory or audio interpreters where people that are blind or low vision wear earbuds and an interpreter sits in the back and speaks into a covered microphone and talks about, they explain what's happening non-verbally on set so that the person experiencing theater can hear the actor's voices and participate that way. But then what they can't see is filled in by the interpreter. Yeah. Um, and then another piece that is sort of newer on the scene in theater and really was given strong legs was by Disney on Broadway and it is sensory sensitive offerings yeah. and people with autism often experience sensory sensitivities mm -hmm. but I say that as a blanket statement it may not be true for every individual but um Disney on Broadway I think they started with Lion King mm -hmm. now 13 or 14 years ago they did a sensory sensitive version of Lion King and targeted audience members that experience sens sensory sensitivity. And what they did was they essentially softened the edges. So they took out strobe lights. They took out anything that might um, negatively impact someone that experiences that kind of sensitivity. They left the house lights on at a dim so you can actually see everything around you versus being in pitch black like a typical audience experience. Yeah. Um, and they take out the major screams, that kind of thing happens during the show, but then there's also a huge pre-show effort that happens. Mm -hmm. That's all about communication. It is all about the way you prepare audience members, specifically those with sensory sensitivity and people on the autism spectrum for the event. So some of that is writing a storybook. It's written in first person narrative so that the person coming to the show knows exactly what to experience from the time they arrived to the time they step out of the door and they yeah. read it as a first person narrative. Mm -hmm. And then you incorporate the script with that so that they know what's going to happen. It is complete and total spoiler kind of thing. And that's great. You want to spoil the event for them because it's not spoiling, it's preparing. Um, yeah. So you communicate that way. You let people know ahead of time that the show may feel a little bit different because you've softened some of those edges mm -hmm. and then because people that often have a disability or a diagnosis are not financially able to join the theater because theater is incredibly expensive mm -hmm. often you discount those tickets because you have you designate one show one yeah. product one day of the production and that mm -hmm. takes away the choice for those audience members you know they can only come that sunday if that's what they need and yeah. so as a way of honoring that they don't have the same freedom you discount those tickets okay. so disney did that with lion king yeah and it kind of took off they do one show annually mm -hmm. at least that's the last i heard um they do one show annually of different productions and yeah. welcome those communities to that space so i wanted to bring that to Chicago and that's what I did with my yeah. internship here. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a okay. It's that's a lot great. of information I just gave you. <laughs> it is. It's like uh yeah. I mean how popular are those shows like the sensory sensitive ones? You said it's once a year type of thing? For Disney, it's once a year. Mm -hmm. Um I think they do well. Yeah. I right before I moved to Chicago I spoke with an executive in the sales department at Disney and they only do it once a year because Disney is part of a commercial structure theater so it's not profitable to do that more than once really it just yeah. is philanthropic but yeah. we did one per production for every production this season at the theater I was working at mm -hmm. so every show that we did and usually it was three or four shows per year every single one had an offering of that yeah. And, you know, in Chicago, it's a much different, uh, it's a much different community, but we would have anywhere from one to, I think, 10 to 20 people that were there specifically to use that offering. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. That's really cool. There's, so there's many different ways of doing it. Like someone's blind, you could have like descriptive, you mm -hmm. can have someone, they could go to a regular show and then it's just, you have descriptions. 
-hmm. If someone's deaf, how does that, how does that work in theater? So most commonly you'll have a day of captions and usually, you know, there's one production is sensory sensitive, one, not production, performance. One performance is sensory sensitive, one has captions and one has an audio interpreter option. Yeah. Um, the other option for deaf people is an American Sign Language interpreter, but oh. not every deaf person uses or is fluent in American Sign Language. And mm -hmm. that is the most expensive accessible accessibility offering that you can do. So that's the least common to see. Okay. That's cool though. I never, I never even thought about that. I think about that in terms of the movies. I never thought about it in terms of live theater. And it's cool to know that that exists. Mm -hmm. um, so how does it feel like the impact that you've had in that space in what you're doing in what you've done when it comes to bringing that to Chicago, like more accessible theater? So you have something that you grew up loving and then mm -hmm. you made it more accessible to this. It's kind of cool. You connected two things in your life that were very important to you. Yeah. To help these people. How does that feel? And do you have any specific stories from that, like the impact that's had on somebody? Yes. I, there is one story. So the very first show that I helped organize that with was part of my internship here. And there was a child that attended the show with his parents and his parents were very nervous. You know, there was a lot of just hesitancy. I didn't speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. I just, you know, did, we had a pre-show address where we, anyone that wanted to see the show had scary puppets. And so part of that preparation was inviting people to come ahead of time and see the puppets lifeless and to explain those puppets can't harm you unless you enact imagination kind of thing. And yeah. so I just did that and we carried on. And during that show, there is a scene where fake snow is dropped mm -hmm. on to the stage and during intermission, we invite audience members and kids to play in that snow. And part of the theater uh, that I was working at, the House Theater of Chicago, they had a lot of audience and performer interaction. So the performers would stay out and interact with the kids. Mm -hmm. And this little boy really loved the girl playing our rat doll. I spent a lot of time with her and then I saw him and another young child and I think a grandma all dancing together mm -hmm. and I didn't think much of it but his parent I noticed his parents were tearful and his parents were like really worked up and they talked to my boss and you know I kind of put a pin in that and was like okay I'll ask about that later um and what happened was his parents pulled my boss aside and said that he is a child with autism mm -hmm. he has never sat through a movie for longer than 20 minutes. And he sat through the entire show. He was completely engaged. He felt comfortable. Um, some, a tool that this specific child used were sound, um, their headphones that sort of dampen sound. So they're not as extreme. He didn't want them. He wanted to completely enjoy the show as, as is. He approached the rag doll to play and then he invited the little girl to dance with them. And his parents said that was a really meaningful moment because he had never socialized with anyone his own age before. He'd never in initiated a conversation with someone his own age. Wow. And then they came back the next year and his mom spoke at the gala and advocated for you know increasing funding for the program. And they just became an incredible part of the theater's community. And we got to see firsthand what that experience could do for a family. It was just one family, but it meant so much. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's, That's really cool to have that kind of an impact on that, that child's life. That's really mm -hmm. cool. So I want to ask you a question about theater because mm -hmm. I've only seen a few shows and it's mind blowing. The first show I saw was 12 Angry Men at the oh, yeah. And it was, yeah. I was like so amazed like that people could be that good at acting. So <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question. It's what's the difference between like, great life theater, right? Or amazing, magical life theater and good life theater. Ooh. What would you say is the difference? That is so hard. There are so many things. <laughs> I would say how well the story is told. Mm -hmm. You know, I think good theater gets lost in moments and great theater tells an impactful story. The whole, you remember, you come out remembering the whole thing 
versus remembering a couple moments that were really good. You know, you come out and you talk about the experience, you talk about how it felt, you talk about how it changed the way you think. Theater in its essence is the oldest form of entertainment we have, but it's also part of storytelling. It's part of record keeping. Mm -hmm. And I think the best theater is the theater you leave the space thinking, I have internal work to do. I don't know if I interact with the world around me in the best way possible, or hmm, I've never considered that before. Maybe I'll do my own research. Something that's thought provoking and connects you to the world around you. That's what I think makes great theater. Awesome. I appreciate that perspective as someone who's, you know, been behind the scenes, been acting, doing all those different things. And I wanted to ask you, so what is the best live theater that you've seen? Or what's like something, what are some shows that people should check out or look up? Mm. Well, sadly, live theater is closed right now because of the pandemic. Yep. Broadway is going to come back strong. It's going to come back amazing. Um, incredible theater that you can watch right now. So the National Theater is a major theater in London and they have put archived productions on YouTube. And you can watch a lot of those for free, I think. Or if you see the National Theater's Instagram, they'll tell you when they're doing um, releases on YouTube. So you can watch old productions and there's incredible stuff. Gillian Anderson was in a production of A Streetcar Named Desire. And actually that was archival footage from the old Vic, which, or the young Vic, the young Vic, which is another theater in London. So London's done a really amazing job. Their theater scene is also incredible. And they have put a lot of stuff on YouTube, so you can see that. Um, I know Hamilton is on Disney Plus, if you want to watch the original cast. There is, I think Shrek used to be, Shrek the Musical, their Broadway taping used to be on Netflix. I know it used to be because I watched it. Um, and those are very fun if you just are looking for something to kind of get your feet wet. But some of the best theater I've seen, I've been very lucky to see a lot of theater. I really loved a production called Sleep No More, which is an interactive, it's an immersive experience in New York City mm -hmm. where a company bought an abandoned hotel and turned it into a multi-level immersive production of Macbeth based entirely in movement. Yeah. And the audience is in the space following the actors the whole time. And it's yeah. very scary, or it can be very scary. And you can leave the space after 20 minutes or you can stay in for all three hours and you literally run side by side with the actors and watch them tell different pieces of the story. So everyone comes out having seen a different show. Wow. It's That's very cool. cool <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it's innovative too, right? It's kind of like mm -hmm. very different. Mm -hmm. So it's like a whole hotel, like an old hotel. It, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was three or four stories. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Will that still exist after the pandemic? Does theater go on forever? Or does this keep going? I want, I believe theater will go forever. Theater's yeah. lasted, I mean, we studied the Greeks. We studied, you know, Kabuki, which is Japanese traditional theater. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese traditional theater. There is, it, it's the oldest form of entertainment for so, so many cultures. Um, you know, there's an incredibly rich historical part of storytelling that's ingrained in Asian culture. There's, in, you know, it's Shakespeare is part of yeah. uh, English culture, English, the UK culture. Um, but also, you know, it's part of the Greeks. You know, you study that stuff. There's Oedipus still happens in school. You still read those scripts and there's a reason for it. Theater just continues to go on and on and on. So my hope is that it doesn't go away. It's lasted this far, this long, and it's been incredibly important to the way I see the community around me. So I, I really hope it, it comes, I hope it becomes more accessible financially and in terms of actual access, but yeah, I think it'll stay. Yeah, I think so too. I was talking specifically about Sleep No More, if that one specifically. Like oh. if a show comes out and it's good, does it just exist forever? Are there ever shows that's just like, this is limited, you can only watch it? Most shows are limited. Um, it depends on where you are. It's different per city and per 
theater, like straight Broadway commercial theater, the big, you know, wicked, that stuff runs forever because it continues to make money forever. And when it stops making money, they close it. Usually there's a baseline amount of money. And if they miss that goal for a certain period of weeks, they close the show. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, they're the most common thing I think you see is limited runs. So in Chicago, a show will run for two months. And if it does really well, it might be remounted in a couple of years, but usually it's a limited run. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know if Sleep No More will come back. I hope it does. Yeah, it sounds very but I don't know. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about neurological diversity because mm-hmm. that's a term you, I don't hear very often or we, I don't think people hear very often. What does that mean? And why is that important to you, neurological diversity? Neurological diversity is important because it encapsulates people that have learning disorders, Mm -hmm. mental health, um, literally the way your brain functions is different in individuals. And so neurological diversity to me is a way of encapsulating the different brain functions of everyone. So people that have disabilities, people that don't have disabilities, people that function on an incredibly high IQ, people that are considered geniuses that are really socially not skilled, people that are incredibly socially skilled and maybe not the best academics, neurological diversity to me just encapsulates everyone at every brain function and brings them into one sort of cohesive, I guess, diverse group. Yeah. The word itself. It's sort of honoring the differences between people with that is that fair to say like there's different brains that people have Mm -hmm. like someone might be like you're saying like super socially skilled Mm -hmm. but they're not really paying attention in class Mm -hmm. but that's a okay um and I'm just trying to think like what what's the vision for that like what do you what would you say is like the ideal vision for having all these neurologically diverse people and having them together in harmony and well, like, what are some visions, what, what are some things we're doing wrong right now, in your opinion? And what are some things we should, we should fix, things like that? Yeah. yeah, I don't know if complete and perfect harmony is attainable because people function in different ways. I yeah. think to me, the ideal scenario would be on demand access. So if you have a theater and someone with sensory sensitivity comes on any night they want, you can adapt the show to make sure that they're welcome in the space yeah. and making things accessible to people that have a more medically true version of, or a medically true definition of neurological diversity, someone with a learning disorder or with, you know, brain development differences, mm. the access to mainstream existence is possible on demand rather than having to be so planned ahead. Okay, I get that. So like the vision is sort of like what you were talking about at the restaurant, sort of like being able to just be accepted and go out in the world and just enjoy the world. Right, to enjoy the world. Mm -hmm. For everybody. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know if you've seen Starbucks, their drive-throughs change where it's a big screen you order at. Yeah. And that is for people, I don't know if it's for, I think it's for people that, sign so if someone is at the drive-thru and cannot hear the person talking to them after a few tries the screen will open and they will see if they are someone that needs to communicate manually that's cool or even Mm -hmm. lip reading because i know sometimes deaf people will do the lip reading Mm -hmm. that could be a part of it too okay that's super cool and is there anything else you want to say on this topic of neurological diversity making things more accessible the world theater um is there anything else that you feel that we missed or something you would like to say on that topic? Um, I don't think so. It's important to me, one, that people seek out the opinions of people with these diversities to not rely on people like me that just care about it. I'm entirely able-bodied. I don't have the same experience. Um, I think it's really important to bring those voices into the room. When a mentor of mine, you know, something we were working on was bringing an advisory committee into the theater. And that advisory committee was to be made up entirely of disabled people, people that were deaf, that were hard of hearing, that were blind, low vision, sensory sensitive, because it's a nice gesture to do things for people that you think need it. It's another thing to actually listen to the community that 
the, the services are intended to support. So mm -hmm. I think it's just important to me that in every conversation, including my own going forward forever, include the people that have these experiences in the discussion. I love that. Yeah, the important, it's the importance of listening. Mm -hmm. Instead of being like, this is what, this is what we're gonna do. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I like that. That's mm -hmm. cool. And I wanted to ask you, well, two different things. Um, you, you started a new business. Could you tell us a little bit about that? It's called Final Draft, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I started a new business. And what like, what's the story behind that? How did you start? <laughs> so this is, you get some credit for this because I had I not been in Financial Mastermind or in the Money Mastermind, I would not have launched it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, a few weeks ago, I was thinking, I was bored. And I was on Instagram thinking about how I wasn't contributing anything. I was just on Instagram. And then I thought something that really has weighed on me in the pandemic is how much my friends in the arts community have lost their income, stability, and jobs because the arts were essentially wiped out from the pandemic. And I switched careers very early uh, into 2020, right before the pandemic. And so I was spared a lot of financial and emotional hardship just because my career changed. And so I was thinking a lot about how I wanted to impact my friends in the community and the arts. And I posted on Instagram that I would happily look at people's resumes and cover letters on a pay what you can sort of scheme. So yeah. anyone that wanted to send me stuff, they could. And I would look over that because I have applied for so many jobs and learned from failing, learned from talking to people that help get you in the door, recruiters, that's the word, um, yeah. learn from all of these people how to really present the best physical package of professional materials. And so I just wanted to do that for artists. And I loved it. I made some extra money. I edited essays. I edited resumes and cover letters. And it brought me joy. It helped people in my community. And it didn't take a lot of emotional effort or emotional physical effort yeah and so then I thought hmm I'm about to go to grad school I could use some extra money but I also want the experience of doing something like my own business just to test it out I'm not sure that's what I want long term but I yeah. thought it would be a good experiment in yeah. a way that contributes to people I think positively I like that what's that's I think that's a really cool idea really cool way of looking at it and what's a similar question that I asked before, like what's an example of the impact that's had on somebody? Cause I can imagine that having a big, big impact, someone getting a job, right. Or something they wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you have any specific stories of that? Actually a friend of mine who I did help just texted me and said that she got a call for an interview at I think it's Lululemon um, within two hours of submitting her materials. Yeah. So, so she cool. got an interview super fast and felt like, she presented herself in the best way possible. Very cool. And do you advise the people to also like include color, like that you were saying earlier, like that personal touch on their resumes? That's I do advise part. that, mm -hmm. especially, I mean, we're in this age where there's so many templates created for you in tech, Microsoft, yeah. Microsoft Word, Google Suite, Canva, all these things have templates. Yeah. And color is built into them. So don't be afraid of that. I always try to push people, especially people that are in the arts. Those are bright personalities. And yeah. these people may not be going into the arts field right now because that's maybe not the most lucrative, but it's important that they bring that artistic flair to wherever they are because it's authentic to them. Yeah, that's cool. So I love that you're doing that. And I love that you're putting your own spin on it. You're adding your own color to your own business of having people authentically put their best foot forward so they can get the job or yeah. whatever whatever role they want to get that's really cool yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's friendlyeditor.com correct it is friendlyeditor.com mm -hmm. so check that out for sure i'm gonna have you edit mm -hmm. my book which i'm almost done writing yay Just i'm like very excited nervous breakdowns and then <laughs> that's cool. we can nervous breakdown together <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, definitely going to have you look at that so you can help organize it because that's the that's the main thing that I struggle with um, so that's very cool that you started that business and finally I want to ask you about your dog oh yeah let's talk about my dog <laughs> his name is her his or her her mm -hmm. her name is bunny 
name is Bunny, like Bunny Rabbit. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. And what's the story of the dog? Like, how did you get that dog? You mentioned that the dog, your dog is deaf and a tripod. So it has three legs. Uh-huh. She's deaf and three-legged. Mm-hmm. Uh, I say she's an impulse buy, but that's not true. She, it took me a long time to <laughs> adopt her. Um, I was feeling very nervous about my future, my senior year of college. And I spent a lot of time in class looking at dogs and I stumbled upon a website called deafdogsrock.com. They are uh, produced or produced, they're owned by rescuedogsrock.com, which is a New York based rescue agency. And there were so many cute puppies and I didn't realize that deaf dogs were in abundance. Mm -hmm. So looking on there, I was like, oh, well, what's in the New York area? And saw this dog that looked like the target mascot and they said she was from texas which is where i am from originally where you are and she'd been rescued from hurricane harvey and she was three-legged because she'd been tied to property and abandoned and so she chewed off her back foot to save herself yeah and then was found so she is missing a foot because she bit it off to save her life she's a tie scar on the existing back leg that shows I have pictures pre-amputation of where she actually bit the limb and it's about the same level on the foot where the wire scar is. So it looks like they probably tied her in multiple places yeah. and we're pretty sure she was being bred. Um, so, cause she had a little bit of like the end of a lactation cycle when I got her. Yeah. So I just was like, Oh, I'll talk. I'll just ask how she's doing in foster. Yeah. And I ended up, deciding that I wanted her and then when I put in my I was going to go visit and I was going to apply and the agency kept saying you're too young I was 20 and I was in college and I was too young and she I mean she was such a severe traumatized case and she's a very difficult breed she's a bull terrier Mm -hmm. and they were like you are not you I we're we're really hoping to place her with a family I don't think it's you and that triggered the competitive part of me where I just, I was like, that's, I'm going to get her. She's mine. But I just had this (laughs) feeling that I needed her (laughs) and I never met her. I fought for her for six weeks. I sent, I think between her foster and I, there were like 95 emails in the chain and I had a case manager by the end of it. I had one person that I called Mm -hmm. and I ended up writing a letter to the agency and said, this is my dog. I am perfectly qualified for her. And until the president of your agency says, I can't have her, you will continue to hear from me. And then I got her. And then she moved into my house and she was a train wreck. She was in terrible shape. <laughs> she, I mean, her foster was amazing. Her foster loved her. Yeah. She just had been traumatized and was a new amputee. And then we yeah. started a very long process of training. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, that's how it started. <laughs> Very cool. That's awesome. That's a cool story. And I totally get what you mean. And someone tells you, no, you can't do this. It's like telling me like, it's yours. Then I'm going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So now she's trained in sort of our own blend of sign language. Um, Full on ASL does not work for her because it requires two hands. And often I have to hold a treat in one hand and sign with the other. So we Dogs can understand sign language. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah, so it is not <laughs> grammatically correct American Sign Language, but we have hand signals that she uses, and non-deaf dogs also respond really well to hand signals. Yeah. Um, it's just the entire form of our communication. And then because she's deaf, I also rely on things like light sensory, smells, vibrations. When I need her attention, I stop on the floor so that she can feel it, <laughs> or I'll wave my hands, or I will tap the furniture that she's sitting on. Yeah. Um, Bunny has an oral fixation. Mm-hmm. She puts everything in her mouth and she's a gigantic mouth. So there's a lot of space, but mm-hmm. something that happened and still happens sometimes uh, when I first got her is that she puts people's hands in her mouth as a greeting and it looks yeah. and initially feels like she might be coming to bite you, but she just holds and sort of like moves around and gets to know you and then lets go. Um, okay. So there are a lot of little 
small details about deaf animals that you should be prepared for if you're going to adopt one <laughs> that I learned on the go. <laughs> yeah, I never would have thought. That's really cool. And I just realized the chat's not working on my phone, but it's working over here. And huh? we have a question from my from Larissa Warren, who's my producer and sister. And it's, what's your favorite Broadway show? <sighs> good question. I love Hamilton. Hamilton. It's not an, that's such a cliche answer. I love Hamilton. I also love Wicked. Okay. Man, Wicked was the show that I saw and left thinking I have to do that for the rest of my life. Wow. And Hamilton is just so cool. It's yeah. so cool. I think it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> you just love it. That's like rap battles, right? I've never seen it, but it's like rap battles between historical not real hat rap battles but like <laughs> yeah it's sort of um it's got more of an operatic structure because it's almost entirely it's not it's almost entirely music and rap yeah. um but yeah all of the music is rap written by Lin-Manuel Miranda that's cool yeah and I remember that, cool. that was huge I remember like he became famous oh he's incredibly famous yeah he went on to he composed for Star Wars uh he composed for Moana yeah that's very in the cool. heights was his original his first broadway musical and that's about to be a movie mm -hmm. or it is a movie it's about to be released mm -hmm. very cool in the heights very cool mm -hmm. okay and um let me see here <laughs> i asked you a question similar to this in the mastermind we have a few more minutes okay and i asked you like what's a small decision you've made that impacted the rest of your life um i wanted to ask you like what's a pivotal moment in your life that shaped the way you see the world today <sighs> well we already talked about bunny so i will think of something else <laughs> bunny is incredibly important <laughs> um i so i am vegan i talked about this in class i'm vegan yeah. um i'm very lucky to have vegan family members so that makes that communal and much easier and collaborative but yeah. i long story short, became vegetarian first, sort of as a 16 year old attempt at dieting because I was insecure and it ended up feeling really good. It felt very true to me. It felt like I was a little bit closer to being in alignment with, you know, the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. And as I, you know, got older and moved forward, I transitioned to veganism and visited a farm sanctuary, which is a farm sanctuary in uh, Watkins Glen, the upstate New York, where they rehabilitate and rehome animals that are discarded from factory farms and the commercial um, meat agriculture. Yeah. And being vegan has impacted almost every other choice I make in my life. It impacts now the furniture I choose, the clothing I buy, the way I recycle. I'm trying to sign up for a composting oh, cool. service that happens in Chicago. So yeah. That was a really big thing, but it also kind of just feels more aligned. You know, I care about every individual life. I care about the way lives are impacted by others. And I care about the way I impact people and the environment and the world. And that's part of why I love accessibility because I want to impact people in a positive way. And so veganism just feels like a, a good alignment, but it started as me just being insecure in 16. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'll try this out. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool how little things like that can completely change the way you think about mm -hmm. the world and yourself, other people. Yeah. I now have a reusable floss container. Huh. The floss is not reusable, okay. but it is okay. biodegradable. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's one of the rare instances where I would say don't floss if you're using reusable floss. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's made from bamboo. You, I think you can compost it. <laughs> but I know it, it's not like plastic. <laughs> no, that's real cool. That's cool. The container is glass though. So you replace huh. thread. That's cool. I'm very proud of it. It was $5. <laughs> Do you thread it yourself or is it like you just like get a ball? You can buy refills. You buy refills and then oh, you pull, yeah. you, you pull the start of the thread up where the little blade is. Yeah. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. And then my final question is, if you could leave the audience with one final important message regarding anything in the world, anything you want to say, um, could be about theater, could be about helping people with special needs. It could be really anything 
It doesn't have to be those things. What is that thing? What would you say? What's your final important message you want to leave us with? Uh, there's a company called, I think they're called Be Good to People. And all they do is brand things with that slogan. That's kind of what they, they put out things in the world that hopefully spark an idea for someone to do something nice. Mm -hmm. And I especially in the time of the pandemic, have made it an effort every day to see if I can do something nice for someone else. Mm -hmm. So the last thing, my final moment is be good to people, be good to the planet, and be good to creatures that are different than you. Yeah. So be good to living people, or be good to living beings and people. Yeah. yeah. Be good to living beings. I love that. That's, an, that's a very important message. I think sometimes it Sometimes it gets overlooked. <laughs> yeah, right. So just literally being nice to people. Yeah. Being nice to I the think, world around you. Yeah, it can change someone's life. It can change. You don't know the impact that's going to have on like way down the line. So that's yeah. awesome. I love <laughs> it. And thank you very much, Maddie. I want to shout out your business, Final Draft. You can find that at friendlyeditor.com. If you want someone who actually thinks deep, deeply about it. I can tell you think deeply about like really wanting to have an impact and help people stand out. Because I, I know if I was going to submit a resume, I haven't submitted one in quite a while, but if I was going to, I would have done it in black and white. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought like, oh, my favorite color is red. Let me put some red on there. <laughs> you know, but now I'm like, hey, that's a cool idea. Like that'll make you stand out. Put, put yourself, that's a huge part of like the new way I think is just putting yourself into everything that you do. Mm -hmm. um, your authenticity. And I love that you do that. You live that out. So check out friendlyeditor.com. Good luck at mm -hmm. Northwestern. I know that was a dream of yours to get into Thank that college. So yeah. that's, that's amazing. And yeah, I'm so, so happy to have you as my guest today. So happy and to be here. Be sure to like and subscribe if you're watching. Like and subscribe mm -hmm. in the buttons down there in case you're unaware. It's 2021. You should know by now. But... <laughs> and then